I'm Yun Seo. Um, it's great to be here with you all today to talk to you about choices. I'm Oliver, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Pixelberry Studios. Our studio developed and self-published choices. I've been making mobile games myself since 2001. So what is Choices? One, it's the top story game in the West. Two, we launched the game in 2016. And currently, it's often in the top 25 grossing apps in the US on the iPhone. Now Choices is a store for multiple story games. The stories range in genre from horror to romance to adventure, but our largest audience is young adult female. And we have active stories that we release on a weekly basis. Unsurprisingly, time and time again, we hear from colleagues in the industry that choices is too simple. And they're right. Choices is deceptively simple. At its heart, it's all about story and choices. But there are a lot of hidden design decisions and processes underlying the game. And so today, to help you really understand how we design choices, I'm going to take you through the team's 14 years of story game development. This way, not only will you learn the decisions we made, but you'll better understand the context and why we made those decisions. Through this presentation, I hope to, one, help you better tell stories in your own games, and two, further inspire your love and passion for making games. Along the way, I'm going to share with you some of the hardest choices that our team had to make and give you a chance to think about what decisions you would have made in those cases. So, the start of our story begins 18 years ago in 2000. My friends and I from Stanford had recently graduated from school and working at other companies. And a few years out of school, we decided to start our own game studio. We were very young and naive. It was the four of us working out of the living room of an apartment together. And we created multiplayer Java browser games. Our players loved the games, and we even had a lot of players in high school emailing us to have us change the IP addresses all the time because their schools would ban the games from being played. But unfortunately, we didn't know how to make money. And so after a year and a half, we ran out of money. And on the very last day, when the day we were planning to shut our servers down, we got a phone call from one of our friends. And he said that his company just got a contract to make cell phone games but they didn't know how to make games. So they asked if we would make the games for them. So we leapt at that opportunity. And that's how luck played a huge role in our team getting started with making cell phone games. Now we looked back at what worked and what didn't, and we realized that we had spent so much time making games that we didn't spend enough time with the business side of things. For myself, I spent about 75% of my time coding and 25% on business. And so, since we had a new chance to save our studio, we decided that I should spend 100% of my time on business. Now, at my core, I'm a nerd, and I'm an introvert. Um, so it's really hard for me to go talk to strangers, people I didn't know, and try and rustle up work from them. Um, but it's something I had to do to save our company. So I go to conferences, and just like today's lecture, I'd get there early. Um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes before the lecture started. And I talked to the people around me. And at one of these lectures, the person on my right was from Sony, and the person on my left was from Sega. And a few months later, we ended up getting contracts with both those companies. And as we started to develop games for other companies, we had more and more time to create our own games. And our studio was one of the first to launch cell phone games in the US. But a few years later, the market had changed. We were still a fairly small studio using the money we had made from contract work to finance our own games. But we were competing against much bigger venture capital-backed companies. 
And these companies started spending a lot of money on big brands. So we thought to ourselves, how do we compete with these bigger companies? And our answer is while they were spending all this money on brands, we would instead focus on creating original games. And so we come, came up with the idea of a high school RPG game. And we picked high school because it's a universal theme that a lot of people can understand. And so we had our idea. But as we started to design the game, we realized that the essence of a high school game isn't about a fighting game. It's about the story, your first day at school, the new friends you're meeting, all the adventures you're going to have in high school. So we switched that game from an RPG game to a story game. And that's how we ended up creating Surviving High School, which was the first story game to launch on mobile in the US. Now, as we worked on Surviving High School, we realized we had to better understand our market. You know, we were guys in our 20s. We understood what teenagers and young adult men wanted, but we didn't have a good idea for what women wanted. And so we started reading this best-selling novel um, that was targeted towards teen girls. And when we hired our first writer, who at the time was a student at Stanford, um, we made him read this book as well, so he would understand what we were looking for. And he's now our head of content. But even now, our team still goes to see teen movies together. Because with choices, we're creating stories for a broad audience, but th that's men and women, young and old. And we try and help our team better understand things outside their own comfort zone. So when big teen movies launch, like when the Twilight movies launched, you'd see our team of people in their 20s and 50s in the middle of the theater on launch day, surrounded by a sea of teen girls, um, all watching the movie together. Now, because we had limited screen space and application size, we de-emphasized graphics. And instead, we focus on making the writing as good as possible. And this is something that continues to this day and is at the heart of our studio. When we launched Surviving High School in 2005, it was the very first Western story game on mobile. And it hit number 26 on Verizon, which was the biggest app store in the US at the time. And so, even 13 years ago, it was clear that story games resonated with players and could be very successful. At the time we launched the game in 2005, there were two main forms of monetization, paid downloads and monthly subscriptions. Now, we quickly realized that we were actually getting a lot of people doing the subscriptions. And it's likely because we priced the one-time downloads much higher at $7.99 or $8.99. And the monthly subscriptions were $2.99. So people were paying less money to try out the game. But they stuck around. And as we started seeing subscriptions becoming more and more important, we went from releasing content on a monthly basis to a bi-weekly basis, and then to a weekly basis. And so every single week for the past 14 years, our team has continued to release weekly content without fail. Now, because of all this weekly content and all the subscriptions we were getting, our studio started to make more money. And we soon had interest from multiple companies who wanted to buy our studio. And in 2006, due to the success of Surviving High School, we sold our studio to Vivendi Games. And with Vivendi, we learned that marketing matters. You know, Surviving High School on our own with our own marketing, we were able to make it number 26 on Verizon. But because they had much bigger marketing teams that knew what they were doing, and they had much better partner relationships, once Vivendi got involved, the game went from number 26 to number three, beating out games like Pac-Man, Tetris, and FIFA. Then, two years later, in 2008, Vivendi and Activision merged. And Activision didn't want to be in mobile games at the time. So I think we're the only studio that Activision ever sold to EA. Um, and EA bought us because they wanted us to take Surviving High School 
and bring it to the iPhone. Now with the iPhone, you have a much bigger screen, which meant we needed better graphics. You had more space, which meant we had room for bigger stories. And it had more memory, which means we could include mem um, mini games with the game. Now at this time, paid apps were the ones that were doing the best on the iPhone. And we saw that there are some paid apps like Doodle Jump and Pocket God, whenever they had new monthly updates, they would move up the charts. And we think it's because these monthly updates would get their players to play again, and those players would get excited and tell their friends, and more people would download the game. Now, because of this, we wanted to put free weekly episodes into our app. So we went to our executives and we asked, can we give away free weekly episodes? And they came back and said, no. We don't want you giving away anything for free. Now at the time, Apple had just announced that they were going to allow for microtransactions on iOS. And so we thought about it and we decided, you know, if we allowed people to pay for content, older content, content that they missed, it'd kind of be like a TV and a DVD model where you get free weekly content like you get when you watch a TV show, and if you miss that content, you could buy the old content. So we went back to the executives with a new model for free weekly content as well as paid microtransactions. And we asked, what if we add paid archives? And again, they said no. They still didn't want us to give away content, so we thought about it some more. And this time around, we went back to them and said, what if for next week's episode that we're going to give away for free, we charge money for it, so for players who are really interested, they'll pay more money. And the executives finally said yes. Now, I'm not sure if they said yes because they really believed in the model or because they just wanted me to stop asking them these questions. But what I did learn from that is that it's important to be persistent, especially when executives say no to you. And when they say no, it's an opportunity for you to refine how you think about things. You know, if they had said yes that very first time, we might have given away free weekly content, but we wouldn't have done microtransactions, right? And when they said yes the second, when they said no the second time, um, we wouldn't have introduced a way for our most excited players to pay for it. But in hindsight, they probably did just say yes, so I'd leave them alone. And we learned that on the feedback they gave us a month before we finished with the game. We had sent them a prototype to look at it. It wasn't fully polished. It still had some issues. And two executives flew up from Los Angeles to meet with me just so that they could tell me that they were canceling the game. And I told them, we're a month away from finishing it. Why do you want to cancel it? And they said, it just doesn't look good enough to be an EA game. Now, I argued with them about it, and I finally was able to convince them to allow us to have one week to try and polish the game up and make it look a lot better. And so we did that. We crunched for a long week, and surprisingly to the executives, the game looked much better than it had before. And it's because our team always believed in putting the fundamentals into the game and leaving the polish for the end. We now learn, though, that at least for these particular executives, having polish and look, having something that looks really good was just as important as having the fundamentals in place. So the executives agreed to launch the game, but apparently they still didn't believe in the game because they came down with a new executive decision. They had lost faith in the game. And so a month before we launched, they made me lay off all our designers, all our artists, and all our engineers. They didn't think the game was gonna do well. They even made me lay off my co-founders. Um, our team was devastated. All we had left were our writers and our QA team. But we had our game that we were going to launch. And we thought the game would do well. So even though the executives didn't believe, we kept moving forward. And it turns out that the executives were wrong. 
When we launched Surviving High School, it hit number eight on iOS, totally beating the executives' expectations. And it did this because it had microtransactions. You know, in the US, we were several years behind what you were doing in Korea with microtransactions. But we were starting to make it work in the West. We even had other companies um, come talk to us, like the CEO of Pocket Gems, wanting to ask us about our game. And so we exchanged notes with them, talking about microtransactions and app purchases, trying to learn what they were doing with their paid and soon free games. Surprisingly, though, the CEO from Pocket Gems, he ended up asking a lot more questions about writing uh, than about monetization. But with all this attention on us, I realized that what people think of your games, whether you've launched it or you haven't, doesn't change who you are or what you do. As long as you're able to work on what you believe in, that's what matters. And fortunately, because Surviving High School was successful, when we came up with a new game idea, the executives were more willing to sponsor it. And so for our new game, we decided to cross a story game with a builder game. We thought the two would work really well together. Now, because it was EA, during this period, I had three bosses in three months. Um, but the good thing is each one of those bosses gave us more resources and more headcount. They all liked the idea. But our last boss, after we were working on the game for six months, he came up with a new executive decision. He had lost faith in our team's potential to execute. And so he laid off our whole team in two sets of layoffs a few months apart from each other. Again, our team was lost. Now at this time, I have the first question I have for you and asking what would you do, right? You've been laid off because your executives don't believe in the game that you're working on. Would you go find a new job or would you bet on yourselves? For my team, this is a question we had to ask ourselves. And in the end, we decided to start Pixelberry. Now when we started our new company, we tried to get the rights for High School Story from EA, but they didn't give it to us. And so we thought about what type of company we wanted to be. And originally, we wanted to be an educational games company, where we could both make games and make an impact in the world. But the more we researched educational games, we realized that they're really hard to be successful. On one hand, you're trying to teach people something. On the other, you're trying to make the game fun. And oftentimes the two pull apart at each other, and there's a lot of tension. And so we decided that instead of being an educational games company, we'd focus on business success first, because it's hard enough to have a successful game. And if we were able to have a successful game, we then try and layer in elements of education. And so even though EA had lost faith in us, we ended up being able to get their help uh, to start the business. Because surviving high school was still doing well. But, and this is why they had that second round of layoffs. They didn't want to support that team anymore, so they asked us if we would continue supporting surviving high school. And this time around, I said, yes, we'd be happy to do that, but we also want the rights to high school stories so we could finish out that game. And because this time around, there was something they were getting out of the deal, they agreed to that. And so we did a deal where we, we used the money for surviving high school that we were doing to help support them, to help fund our team so we didn't need to raise outside money. And we used the extra money we had to continue working on high school story. Now, because high school story was a half story, half builder game, we changed how we told stories. We made the story quests much shorter. They ranged in length from one to three minutes. We also use the stories to try and tie an emotional connection to the buildings that people were putting into their school. We had quests and characters associated with each new building. And we continued to release quests on a weekly basis. Now, the executives didn't believe in high school story the same way they didn't believe in surviving high school. And again, we proved them wrong. When we launched high school story, 
to hit number 10 on the top grossing list. And after the success of High School Story, we decided to return to our roots and create another story game, just focus on stories. And there are three things we wanted to do with this story game. The first was we wanted to have multiple stories in one game. The second is we wanted to use an energy system for reading new episodes. And the third is we wanted to have a diamond system for premium choices, so that as players made choices, they could take free choices or they could pay money for even more interesting choices. But as we started working on this game, we got our first competition in the mobile story space in eight years. And the CEO who had asked us a lot of questions about surviving high school, turns out he asked those questions because he was inspired by our game and they launched their own story game. And their story game episode had two out of the three features we were planning. They had multiple stories in one game and they had an energy system for reading new episodes. The third thing they were missing was those premium choices. So we were really mad when they came out with this game. It was pretty clear they were very inspired by all the work we had done. But as we watched their game, we realized that they were only in about the 200s in top grossing. And for our team, we always wanted to create games that had the potential to be a top 50 game. So as much as we wanted to compete with them, we decided to put the game that we were working on on hold and go work on something else. And during this time, we kept working on High School Story. And we took that idea for premium choices and brought it into High School Story in the form of premium quests. At the end of each of one of our quests, we'd have a cliffhanger that could lead to either free quests or paid quests. And, and users could choose which ones that they wanted to play. And this worked out really well for us and helped us maintain momentum for High School Story for quite some time. But after we introduced this feature, episode had been out for a while. And a year and a half later, they launched an update with three major changes. The first major change they included were premium choices. The second thing they did is they brought in licensed content. They added in Demi Lovato, uh, the singer, stories about her, as well as stories from Mean Girls, the movie. And then the last thing they did is they improved their art. And the combination of those three things had their game leap up in the charts into the top 50 games. And so with episodes shooting up the charts, we decided it was time for us to reclaim our crown and create our own story game app. Now there were two things about episode that they did really well and that we had not done before. The first were animated graphics. In their game, when you're reading the story, you see the characters move and act out what's happening in the story. And it made it look really cool and fun. The second thing they did was they had user-generated content. This allowed them to have tens of thousands of different stories written by their players. So this brings me to the next question. Episode just hit the top 30. How do you want to compete? Would you follow in their success? Or would you risk doing it your way? I think for a lot of companies in our space, they would follow and copy episode. But because we've been doing story games for so long, we decided to do it our way based on our own experiences. Where episode was strong with the younger demographic, we design choices for an older audience. So instead of animated graphics, we decided to use portraits so that we could have more realistic looking characters that would be better for an older audience. Now this wasn't an easy choice for us. I really wanted to do portrait graphics. Our CEO, Kara, who as a 20 something year old woman, much um, better fit our target audience, she wanted animations. And so we argued and we debated about this. And it wasn't an easy decision for us to make. But in the end, even Kara was convinced that more realistic and better looking characters would help our game. 
Now, when it came to user-generated content, we decided not to do that. And we knew user-generated content could be great, but it also can be very inconsistent in quality. We decided instead to rely on our mini internal writers to produce higher quality content. We might not have as much content, but we'd have better content. Now, we also opted to launch choices only with original content. We thought that by doing original content, we'd be able to write stories faster rather than getting the approval process from licensed brands. Now, during this time, we've been talking to a lot of companies um, who were interested in buying Pixelberry because of the success of High School Story. And when we told them that we were going to compete with Episode, because Episode was doing so well, they got really excited. But then we told them what we were specifically going to do, and they thought we were crazy. <laughs> um, every single one of them thought that we should just copy Episode directly. They all said that, you can't beat animations with portraits. They also said, you can't beat 10,000 plus user generated stories with your own stories. <coughs> you can't beat brands with original content. And you can't beat a market leader that has a two and a half year head start. Maybe you'll do well because you have experience, but you're not going to beat them. Now, we started explaining how we were thinking about it. And some of the executives started to get it more and more. And so in the end, we ended up, up getting multiple offers from different companies. And we narrowed down to one company, we accepted their offer, and we started negotiating the term sheet. Now, as we negotiated that term sheet with them, the executive told us that he wanted to see a prototype of choices. And from our past experiences, Showing prototypes of story games to executives is a very, very bad idea. So we told him, we don't want to show you a prototype, but he insisted. We showed him the prototype, and unfortunately, a few days later, we got a new executive decision. We realized in hindsight, he never fully believed that our studio understood the story space, and he didn't think Choices was going to do well at all. And when his boss asked him, do you think Choices is going to be a $50 million game? He didn't think we'd come close to that. And so a few days before we were going to sign the term sheet, he walked away. Now, the unfortunate thing for us is that we were running out of money at this time. So I held a studio meeting, and I told everyone in our studio that the buyer dropped out. And they already knew that we were running out of money. And I gave them a choice. I said, we can launch choices on schedule in July. But because we're behind, we're only going to be able to launch with one story. Or if the founders take our salaries to minimum wage, and everyone else in the studio takes a 20% pay cut, and we don't know for how long, we'll be able to launch choices a month later with three stories. We told them we'd answer all your questions, and then the management team would leave the room, and that they should discuss them among themselves. And after they discuss it, they should go home, and they should sleep on it and talk to their significant others about it. And the next day, they should take an anonymous vote and tell us what their decision was. So if you were there, how would you vote? Would you launch choices on time? Or would you risk taking a 20% pay cut so that you could launch choices the way you wanted to? Now the next day, the team came back to us and they told us that an overwhelming majority voted to take the pay cut. The team believed in what we were doing with choices. And more importantly, they believed in each other. But what was most moving to me wasn't the fact that they believed in each other. It was that some employees even came up to me and they told me that someone on the team was buying a house at the time and that because they were getting a mortgage, it would be really bad if they reduced their salary right then. So they asked me, 
can you take more from my paycheck so that our friend's paycheck stays the same? It was amazing that they cared about each other that much. And this is something that you don't talk about in gaming a lot. But I really think that teams that work together for a really long time have a huge advantage. It's because you understand each other, you trust each other, and in doing the same thing for a long time, you learn a lot. And so for us, a week after we launched Choices, we were doing well enough that we were able to move everyone's salary back to normal. And two months later, we were able to return the difference to everyone of the pay cuts they had taken. Now, we had a great launch for a couple different reasons. The first, I'm sorry. The first is because we got players excited before launch. Google had just recently introduced a pre-registration feature. And so we had hundreds of thousands of fans of High School Story and our other games coming in to pre-register for choices before we launched. The second is we launched with multiple stories so that players knew that there'd be a lot more content coming. The third is we released weekly content right away so that players knew to keep coming back. And the fourth is we engaged with players directly. During that first week of launch, Karen and I and other people on the team, we'd be messaging with people on our Google Play reviews, telling them um, and answering questions that they had about the game. And I think that really helped them feel engaged and knowing that people on our team actually cared what they were thinking. But there are things we could have done better. One of the things is instead of launching weekly support for three stories, we only had time to launch weekly support for one story. We also launched our game globally, but in hindsight, it would have been much better to not launch it to all countries, but just to focus it to the ones that were okay with English-only games. One of the reasons Karen and I spent so much time in the reviews is because we had a lot of players from Russia and other countries who were complaining that our game was only in English. And because we were getting feature support from Google, it's super important for us to maintain at least a 4.0 rating so that they would continue to feature us. And we were always scared we were gonna drop right below that mark. Another thing we could have done better is we should have checked the skin colors of our characters side by side instead of one by one. And what I mean by this is we started, we were surprised that we get players complaining that we didn't have diversity in our games. And for us, it was really important to try and be as diverse as possible. And when you look at the characters at the bottom here, on an individual basis, we thought that it was obvious that they represented different ethnicities. But we had never put them side by side. And when you put them side by side, you start to see that the skin colors don't look that different. We had totally messed up. And so we made the changes to the skin colors that you see on the upper row and we openly apologized on our in-game blog. And because we were really open about our mistakes, I think players were much more accepting of the fact that we had made a mistake. And they felt like their input and what they complained about was actually getting addressed by our team. Now, as we continued to grow choices, there are some hidden advantages our team had. The first was our ability to grow our content pipeline as quickly as possible. And this was be because we already had in place a robust system for hiring writers. We've been doing it for 10 years, so we knew how to hire them, how to interview them, and how to train them. We also, for the past 10 years, had an established weekly content process. So our writers, our QA, and our development teams knew how to work well together. And third, we invested heavily in release tools so that as we ramped up the cadence of our content releases, we were able to keep up without needing to hire that many more people. This is an area where I think the years of experience we had in making story games, it wasn't apparent. And so for that executive who didn't think choices would do well, 
he didn't realize that all those years of experience would actually help us as we launched. So even though Episode may have been in the space for two and a half years longer than we had, we'd been making story games for a decade more than them. And that made a huge difference in our ability to slowly gain on their game and pass them in the charts. Now, another hidden advantage I think we had is our culture. As choices started to do better and better, we started hiring more and more writers as quickly as we could. We came to realize it's not just how fast you hire people, it's also who you don't lose. You know, just two months ago, we hired a new writer to our team. And it turns out he was a head writer and in charge of the writing team for one of the copycat games. There are a lot of copycat games that have been trying to copy us. And he told us that when he was trying to hire writers for his game, he would look at all these resumes and he'd see that there'd be resumes for people who are working on episode. There'd be resumes from people who are working at Telltale Games and for other story teams. But the one person he really wanted to hire was a writer who worked on Choices. And he never saw a resume from a Choices writer. And that's because since we launched Pixelberry, we've never lost a writer to a competitor. All the writers we have, they love working together with the other writers on the team. And they're happy staying with the team. And that's made a big difference, I think, in making it much harder for copycat companies to try and catch up to us because they can't take our talent away. And although our game did well, there were things that we could have done a lot better. You know, the first is we added new features way too slowly. Um, we were too slow to grow our development team. I think in the past, because of all the layoffs we had faced, we always were scared that we'd have to lay people off. And so, you know, we had to go through those 20% pay cuts. And we wanted to make sure as we hired people, we'd be able to support them. And because we didn't have a big development team, we had limited resources. So we decided to focus on the internal tools rather than playing facing features. But I think this hurt our game. Another thing is success made us too conservative. It's a case where when you start doing well enough and you start making enough money, you get scared to roll out changes. Uh, we had actual A-B tests that were telling us that some of the new economy changes would do better than our current economy. But we were too scared to roll them out too soon. We wanted more test results. We also thought that maybe we should save these economy changes that would make the players happy for other things we'd introduce that may make them not as happy with the game. We should have rolled these out sooner. And another mistake we made was we spent too much time trying to match what people in our space were doing. At the same time that choices and episode were doing well, um, there were chat stories that are based just on text messaging type interfaces that started doing well in the App Store. And so we started focusing on creating chat stories for our game, and we spent several months doing this type of storyline. And we knew that these stories would likely hurt our economy, but we thought that we'd make up for it in our retention. Because chat stories are so much faster to write, we'd be able to release them on a daily basis and keep players engaged for a lot longer. But we were totally wrong. We didn't realize that our choices style stories monetize so much better than chat stories that when we had the chat stories in the game, the time people were spending on it took time away from them playing the better monetizing product. But despite our mistakes, choices did well. But unlike our previous games, it took a lot longer for us to move up the charts. It took us a year and a half, actually, before we hit our current peak, which was number eight on iOS. And we did well because players loved our game. Some players loved it because they finally felt like they had stories where they belonged. One player said, I am the beautiful young princess young adult novels refused to let me be. We had another player who wrote into us and said, I named my preemie son born two days ago after one of Choice's characters. And the more players we saw loving Choices, the more we thought about the game's future. 
Now, we thought it was a really interesting intersection between the imagination that books allow you to have with the interactivity of games. Making those choices makes you feel more involved with the stories. And we also think it brings in elements of TV with the weekly cadence and regular content that you get. And so we call this category mobile fiction. And our question was, can we grow this category large enough for it to be considered a new media format? And it's so rare for new media formats to come around. One model in our mind of an example of something new coming out is Webtoons and what they've achieved in Korea, where you can actually view it as a new media format, a new way for people to consume content. And as we thought about the future, VCs started reaching out to us who wanted to invest in our company. And other companies reached out to us who wanted to buy us. Which brings us again to what would you do? Choices is the biggest success you've ever created. Should you sell your company? Would you sell? Or given all the experiences that you faced with layoffs and bad executive decisions, would you want to control your own fate? For us, we decided surprisingly that it was time to sell. And the reason we made this decision is because we decided the opportunity for mobile fiction was so large that we really needed help from a much larger company. We were fortunate that Choices was the top 25 game on iOS. So we had a lot of companies who were interested in buying us. Basically, almost all the top game companies with a presence in casual mobile game space were interested in us. And we had a lot of different offers from companies and good choices on which company we wanted to become a part of. Now, as many of you know, we ended up deciding to join Nexon. Why Nexon? First, it was the people. They were smart and ambitious, but they were also the type of people that we'd want to work with for the next 10 or 20 years. Right? We always had a long-term view on our game, and we wanted people who also had a similar long-term view. And we love the fact that with Nexon, that they were running games like Maple Story and Dungeon Fighter, who 10 years after they've been running those games are doing higher revenues than they had done even in the past. And we thought that knowledge would be really useful to us as we looked at choices as a long-term media format. And third, we wanted global help. When we were ready for it, we knew that because Nexon is strong in Asia, they'd be able to help us bring our games to other Asian countries. Now, you've heard me talk about a lot of difficult times that our studio has gone through, but I actually haven't talked to you about the most difficult time we had. And this time occurred about a month after we launched High School Story. We had an in-game help system in High School Story that allowed players to communicate with us. And we got a message from a player, and this time it wasn't what problem they had in the game or a complaint about the monetization. This player told us that she was planning to kill herself. We were shocked and totally scared. We didn't know what to do. So Karen and I, we got on the phone and we called the suicide prevention hotline together to ask them what we should do. And they told us we should tell the player that they should get professional help. Now we felt like if that's all we did, that the player might just ignore us. So we said, is there something else we should do? And they said, no, all you should do is tell them to get professional help. So our management team, we discussed that phone call. And on one hand, we thought, if all we did is tell them to get professional help, they might ignore us. And then we might be responsible in some way for them not, not living. But on the other hand, if we decide to engage with them, it could be even worse. We might tell them the wrong things, and then we would be directly responsible um, for them dying. So we didn't know what to do, and we debated it. But as we talked about it, it became pretty clear what we should do. And so we messaged the player back, and we told her, you should get professional help. But we also told her that we were there to listen to her if she wanted to talk to us. And for the next few days, we had the most stressful week I've ever had um, you know, in my career. Every time the player messaged to us, 
Karen and I were really scared. And together, we would work on the message that we would send back, always worried we'd be telling the player the wrong thing. We were even more scared when we didn't hear from the player, wondering if they had done something to themselves. And um, we learned over time that there are bad things happening in her life, and because of those, she was being bullied and teased. And we were just there listening to her, letting her know that there are people who cared about her. And fortunately, after a week, she wrote back to us, and she told us that she was finally getting professional help. And it was such a relief to us. And in her message, she also said, all of you at the studio should know you're the reason I'm still here, as weird as that sounds. And this incident really showed us how much power games really have. You know, players, they love reading books, they love watching TV shows, but because games are so interactive, they really feel connected to the characters you create in your games. And she was unwilling to reach out to her friends or her parents or other people, but she's willing to reach out to this company that created characters that she could relate to. Now, we were also reminded of our own experiences growing up. For myself, I told our team about a time where, when I was in seventh grade, whenever our Spanish teacher was late to class, a much bigger eighth grader would bully me. He'd pick me up and hold me over a trash can, or he'd put me in a headlock, and I always thought he was crazy. And I never told anyone that he was bullying me. In hindsight, as an adult, I knew I should have told my parents. But I thought that if I told an adult and he found out about it, he would just get more mad and he might snap and actually hurt me. Other people on our team told us about their experiences as well with being bullied. And we started researching bullying and suicide more. And we discovered that one in 13 teens have tried to kill themselves. And there are so many people who need help. But fortunately, we had a game that could reach some of these people. And so we ended up partnering with a nonprofit, CyberSmile, that focuses on cyberbullying. And we created storylines to help educate players on cyberbullying. We also connected players in need with trained counselors so that when they reached out to us with problems like suicide or cutting or depression or bullying, there'd be trained volunteers who could discuss it with them. We had in-game items where we raised $300,000 for CyberSmile, and together we helped a lot more people. They told us examples of talking players off of the roofs of a house, of helping people who were being bullied or who were cutting themselves. Our game was finally making a difference. And we continue this work with choices. We focus on diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity, sexual orientation diversity, and just diversity of thought, as well as we started talking to nonprofits about including their messaging into our stories and choices. So through this talk, I hope you've learned, one, how to tell better stories in your games, and two, that the passion you have for making games has been further grown hearing the, about the trials and obstacles our team had to overcome. But I also hope that you're inspired to think more broadly about the power of games, what we can do to connect people and affect their lives more profoundly than we realize because of the games we make. And so despite whatever obstacles you encounter, or what anyone else thinks. When it comes to both what you care about when you make your own games and what differences you can make, I hope you remember that ultimately it's your choice. Thank you.